Hey everyone, David Spinks here, the Community Manager at Low Web. We're here with Martin Varsavsky today, who's the CEO and founder of Phone. Phone? How do you say it? Phone. Yes. Phone. Yes. <laughs> um, Martin's uh, he's got a long history, starting lots of amazing companies in all different industries. Currently, he's in Madrid, but he's been everywhere, it seems like. Uh, Martin, do you want to take a minute to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your history? Well... I'll try to fit it in a minute, yes. <laughs> uh, Martin Varsavsky, born in Argentina, tech entrepreneur, founder of Viatel, Jastel, Yadotcom, Einsteinet, Phone. And uh, currently I'm the CEO of Phone, which is the largest Wi-Fi network in the world. And I also teach at the university. That was good. That was quick. That was I feel like tough. you might have skipped over a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so you, you have so much experience. Let's start at the beginning. What was your first company? Well, I, um, I had actually a very rough beginning because I grew up in Argentina during the times of the military dictatorship. And I, my dad was a professor. We had to flee the country because of political reasons. And we went to the States um, where he was uh, teaching at NYU and I was studying at NYU. And my first, first company uh, was actually a search engine, but it was a physical search engine. Uh, it was called uh, Datum Trade Services. And I was arbitraging the knowledge that was inside the NYU library with the knowledge that existed outside of the NYU library. And so I realized that the NYU library had a lot of directories, because before the internet was started or became available, there were directories that people would pay a lot of money for, but I mean a lot of money, like $30,000, $20,000 to buy all sorts of directories. These directories could be, for example, directories of companies in a certain state or industries or like a lot of information and a lot of databases were private, but if you were a student, you had access to this information for free. So I started a, a data service over fax where people would fax me questions. I would go into the library, look them up, and sell them the answer. So instead of having to spend like $10,000 for a subscription, they would pay me five or 10 or something like that and get a fax with the answers. So I was, I was, I was basically I mean, maybe it was a crime, I'm not sure, I hope that by now it has, uh, the statute of limitations has run out, but I was selling the information that was inside the library to anybody who wanted it. How old were you at that point? 18. Very cool. And then when you were 24, you started, what was it, Urban Capital Corporation, which was a yes. real estate company in New York, right? It was sort of the beginning of the loft movement. There were... Um, some of friends of mine were artists and squatters, and they were they were going into buildings and not paying. And I thought, well, why don't we try to get rezoning of these buildings? Because New York City then, in the in the eighties, the mid eighties, it still had this idea that it could make it as an industrial city. And a lot of the buildings in Tribeca, Soho, Nolita, Lower East Side, were were considered industrial buildings, but there were no industries. And so people were illegally occupying them or illegally living in places that were zoned industrial. But together with this person who's still my partner, Len Khan, who was commissioner for leasing for the city of New York, we started this company called Urban Capital and we started asking for legal approvals to rezone buildings into residential and office use. And we did half a million square feet of loft buildings between my age of 24 and 27. That's incredible. So how did you get that started? Did you raise funds for that or how did yeah. that I Yeah, that was, um, that was difficult. I mean, I raised uh, around maybe $40 million. Um, and I raised them by knocking on a lot of doors, getting a lot of rejections and a lot of rejections. I mean, 
maybe hundreds of rejections. And uh, even the same bank who wouldn't give me a $40,000 a year job because at that time I also needed money just to pay for my life and my father had died. But that bank gave me a $6 million loan without knowing that it was the same bank that had rejected me for a job, you know. So we got, we got the, the funds from banks and from individual investors. That's amazing. And so you, you started that with someone else? Did you have co-founders? Yeah, I had a co-founder, Len Khan, like I was saying, who's still my partner now. Um, in fact, one of the properties that we bought then uh, for, I think, like uh, $6 million is going to close for $62 million, uh, next week. And so actually the end, of, the end of urban capital is next week. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid, David, if you ask uh, Martin about all his companies, we're going to be here tomorrow in 12 hours. <laughs> of course, yeah. I know. Well, um, so, I just so wanted to get an idea of how you kind of started out. Um, no, he, he started like, how many did you start, Martin? Um, well, the, I would say seven, seven companies. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. And I, so what's really interesting to me is that so many of your companies are in completely different industries. And for a lot of people, they s tend to like find one thing that they're really passionate about or um, that they're really comfortable in and they stick to that industry for a long time. What has it been like for you? How do you discover new industries that you want to go to? And then how do you get acquainted with brand new industries that you weren't involved in before? Well, the exp I would say I had an exploratory period of my life. And then I kind of been in the same industry for the last 12 years, let's say. But until then, I was in, I started in real estate. I then left the management of that real estate company, even though I'm still partnering that company, as I was saying. I did a biotech company. I built a biotech company um, until 1990. And then in 1990, I started working in telecoms internet. So it's been 22 years of doing telecoms and internet, first telecoms, then internet, and really fun, which is the largest Wi-Fi network in the world, but it's like a telecom internet company. So I've been on that theme, which is making more bandwidth available to people, more convenience, less cost, sharing, the sharing economy, because fun is about sharing. So the subject of telecoms and internet has been the same. The, I would say the changes were at the beginning, but but it is true that also in 2002 or 2003, I started, I co-founded another company in Alternative Energy, and this company was mainly managed by the person who used to manage, who used to be my CFO at one of my companies, Jastel, Miguel Salis. And Miguel Salis, who then used to run my family company, went on his own to do Eolia, which I backed him. I, backed, I was the first investor in Eolia. And that company uh, is, is uh, one of the largest alternative energy companies of Spain. Uh, it was worth $1.2 billion before the crash. Now, the, with, because of the Spanish a uh, crisis is worth maybe around half of that, but it's still a very valuable company that will do 50 million in profits this year. And uh, Martin, uh, remind me, um, how much did you make from all your companies being sold, uh, talking about sharing? Um, I, I let me, let's start to, I'll give you some, I'll give you, I'll give you some summaries. I... It, uh, without counting all the taxes I paid and without counting uh, also personal situations, um, the, numbers are, the numbers that are... The numbers you don't that have are, to answer, but it's up to you if you want to answer. No, no, I, what I can tell you, I can give you some pointers. No, I don't mean... I, it's, look, I'm not, like, I'm not like one of those people in Europe who think... I always said that Americans think, think nudity is pornography and Europeans think that talking about money is pornography. That's now, why I, I, can be, I can be in Europe and I can talk about money and I don't think it's pornography. I also don't think nudity is pornography, by the way. Uh, but in any case, I, the numbers that, are, that I can share is the ones of public companies that were sold publicly. Or So in the case of Jastel, 
In the case of Viatel, I invested 200,000, and by the time I sold my shares, which I had maybe 20%, it was worth 1.2 billion. Um, Not too bad. In a, it was, it was, it was a, well, it, over 10 years, okay, 10 years of, of a lot of work. Uh, Jastel, I invested 5 million, and by the time I sold my shares, the company was worth around 600 million. I kept a few shares. The company is now worth 1.3 billion, um, and is the second largest publicly traded telecom operator in Spain. And then uh, Ya.com, we started with 38 million euros, and we sold it for 550 million euros to Deutsche Telekom. Um, and uh, and Fon, we've raised so far. 41 million euros, but we have, um, we've been making money for three years, so we have 12 million euros in the bank, and the company is, uh, is let's say the valuation is, is not public, so I can't disclose, but it's being appreciated, let's say, by the investors. So those are more or less some numbers that I can share. Oh, this is cool. So you made um, a lot of money, basically. How, uh, why do you still work? Well, I, I, um, the other day I'll give you, last night we were, we were here in Madrid talking about the, how much money are the players of the Spanish football team going to make if La Roja wins the Euro Cup, right, which is going on right now in Europe, the championship. And so the government of Spain gives an incentive to the players, and these are the, some of the best paid players in the world. And so the, con the dinner conversation was, is, there an, is it necessary to pay more to a football player uh, to win the national team, right? And my argument was that it wasn't necessary in the sense that I felt that they were so happy and proud to win the Euro Cup that it was, in this time of crisis, it was unnecessary for the government of Spain to use precious money to pay the players a half a million euro bonus or whatever they pay them, but it's something like that, to win the Euro Cup. And so what I do, I do for money, but what I do, I do, I, I'm sure I enjoy what I do as much as the players enjoy playing football. It's, it's, it's what I like to do. And the consequence of what I do is making money and sometimes losing money, or, or sometimes I say that in business, sometimes I, I make money and sometimes I learn, let's say, hopefully, when I, I lose. Know what, yeah, I know what you're but, saying. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's not, I really, I mean, I, I know it sounds, maybe people are not going to believe in when I say I would do it for free, but there's a lot of work I do for free, like my foundation, my teaching, and, yep. I, and it's the same passion that I have. So it's not about money. I know it sounds, I mean, I know a lot of people are not going to believe me, but I'll still say it. It's a passion to turn ideas into businesses. And then the consequence of this is to make money and so be it, and that's great. But it's not the original motivation for what I do. So I have more information than uh, David on, uh, on uh, your Le web talk in London on June 19th and 20th which is coming next week, basically. Uh, by the way, we passed 1,000 participants, so it should be good. And, right. uh, yeah, and Martin sent me slides, uh, which I've looked at. And they're le really, really a lot of fun. We've had spilling all the bills. Can you explain what you're going to talk about, uh, Martin? Well, I, I decided to come out of the closet, let's say, uh, on a taboo. You know, there's a lot of taboos that people... Uh, I mean, there's taboos, of course, about being gay, and that's the original thing about coming out of the closet or things like that. But entrepreneurs... Oh, are you announcing something today? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not about being gay. <laughs> but it's about, it's about the taboo that affects entrepreneurs, which is that people believe that entrepreneurs work their ass off, right? And that entrepreneurs work all the time. And entrepreneurs nourish that dream, and they should be the first ones to show up at the office, the last ones to leave, and so on. 
but I have led my life taking a great deal of vacations and not... So what, what is it? How much? Well, like maybe 12 weeks a year of vacations. And, uh, Can you define vacations for? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say two months in the summer, one, one in the winter, vacations here and there. And I... So four months. And I, and I, I really... I don't believe that, I believe that what's true about architects, what's true about engineers, what's true about lawyers, I what's true what's about doctors is not true about entrepreneurs. And I will talk about that. I will explain how entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs are not paid for their time. They're paid for their creativity, their organizational skills, their ingenuity, their their persistence, their salesmanship, their tenacity, but it's not their time. And then I will talk about what else I do, you know, when, with all the time I have for believing in this, but that will leave for the talk. No, I, I agree. It's, it's more like uh, you can have a, an idea of a business or an idea for your business, just, you know, having fun with someone. And I, I find myself uh, having more and more of those ideas barely never in an office, right? Yes. Well, actually, the office... I go to the office only in the mornings. I find the office expeditious to do things, and of course I have to be in the office and I have my meetings, but my creativity, is I don't have it at the office. At the office I just solve problems. Um, yeah, my creativity is more about riding my bike and, and just having ideas, talking to people, hanging out, doing nothing. I, I, mean, I mean, the idea of fun, I had hanging out in Paris doing nothing, looking for Wi-Fi. So you let know? me. Oh, was it? Oh, was it? How you got the idea? So the. Uh, let me get it right. Dude, you're taking four months of vacation, and the rest of the time you only go half of the time to the office, and the other part of, of the other half of your time you you bike. No, I see my family, <laughs> friends. <laughs> if I don't want Nina to listen to this and and uh, all of a sudden say, yeah, he's always biking. He's never at home. <laughs> I'm at home. I'm with the kids. Uh, but so, yeah, I, I just I was just biking now in Madrid, by the way, where the sun sets only at ten o'clock. So that was fun. Okay, so for, for, for those of us, uh, of those of you actually watching us on YouTube, um, and I, I I know we we have uh, about fifty sixty people right now uh, watching live, and then of course more uh, recorded when we record it. But you can ask questions to Martin on the uh, live comments, which is on the right of the YouTube page. And Martin, maybe you want to retweet the link again, but uh, if not, we have a lot of people here. So there is one question already, uh, which if, if you need it again, it, it's in the chat from Martin. Um, so, uh, someone is asking, it's, his name is Fabio Buati, at least on YouTube, what is the future of the internet for you? Uh, apps, smart TVs, so how, how do you see the future? Like it's a very broad question. Well, uh, the smart TVs is a very important part of the question, and I've been giving a lot of thought to, to smart TVs because I think we have more visibility when we think about smartphones. We have a little less visibility, but we, we have a lot of it when we think about tablets, but we have much less visibility about big screens. And the biggest war of the next five years is who's going to dominate the big screen. Right now, the, the big screen is chaos. It's Samsung, it's LG, it's Google TV, it's Apple TV. There's no dominant player. There's Boxy, there's, there's uh, the, the Sony Box, there's the... Everybody's Google trying TV to do software. something on, on, on the big screen. The, 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 the battle for the big screen hasn't been won by anybody, and it could potentially be won by, by somebody coming out of nowhere, right? I mean, I mean it's, it's, it doesn't need to be Apple, it doesn't need to be Google, it doesn't need to be Microsoft, which is less likely. But, but for example, Microsoft has elements to the big screen that are amazing, like Kinect. I, I believe that the gestures of Kinect and the, the whole Xbox, like the Xbox is one of the best products of Microsoft, or if not the, the best, I mean, I don't use the others. But it is, it is um, there's a lot... So, so the next five years, where there's less visibility and more opportunity, is, I would say, the big screen. The rest, I think Windows Phone is going nowhere. 
I think BlackBerry is dying, even though I'm sorry because I love typing on a BlackBerry. Uh, I think obviously Android and, and iOS are the big winners. Today I read that Android has uh, 900,000 new installs a day. Um, iOS will not be number one because Apple prefers to be number one in profits and not in popularity. And the only popularity context that Apple wants to win is in the bottom line. And so um, I think Google will dominate. Android, Android will be the new Windows. What, what Windows. what Windows was for computers, Android, Android will be for smartphones. And then, and then Mac, iOS and Mac will always retain this relationship of the best product, highly profitable, but elitist and expensive. Uh, and then the rest of the internet, I mean, I have a lot of ideas on connectivity and wireless, but I, well, I think... What, what do you think about the, the internet of things? Uh, you know, like connected objects, and because well, I know we, it's, uh, we, we invented La Fatera together. Yes. Um, which uh, was a joke that we had where we were talking about uh, a, a Wi-Fi scale that you could, you know, like step on and it would send your weight to all your followers. And the French guy, Whitings, did that. So that was a lot of fun. But it's something that you have passion for, right? Can you describe? And now we, there is Nest, right? You know, this object that you can change the temperature, it's Apple, guys, um, of your house also remotely. So, like, everything is getting connected. We'll have uh, Wi-Fi 3Gs and so on. How, how do you see your future on that? Well, I, um, I'm, I'm partners in a company that is very much a participant of the Internet of Things. It's called Spotnik, and it's, it's a Swiss company that's become, uh, was quite unsuccessful, I would say, for a year and a half, like many of my companies, and then took off, like in the last few months. The main customer of that company is a water pipe company. So... This company is a mobile operator whose customers are only things, okay? And the biggest customer now is a water distribution company that wants to have SIM cards in all their valves to see that the pipes are running at the right pressure, right? So you would say, who would start a mobile operator for things, right? Well, a lot of things we now own, like a Kindle, have... Sim co have mobile connectivity, but we don't we don't negotiate that mobile connectivity, right? We don't we don't buy a Kindle and then go to Verizon or go to Orange and sign up for the Kindle. What we do is we buy the Kindle, and and Amazon itself has made a deal with some mobile operator in each country to deliver the books. And so objects are getting SIM enabled, but the customer is the owner of the object who doesn't have a relationship with the mobile operator. So there needs to be a mobile operator for things, and that's what Spotnik is. Now, the question is, what are these things? Like, what are the things that are going to be connected to the Internet? And I believe that there's going to be uh, a tendency to connect the most implausible things to the internet, that there's going to be things connected to the internet that you would have never imagined, that it had no sense to connect to the internet before. But what is the driver of this connectivity? It's cost. It's the fact that it's becoming so cheap to connect everything to the internet, to connect everything to Wi-Fi, to connect everything to through a SIM, um, that the additional benefit is worth it. The additional benefit to having sensors, to having temperature sensors, to having your fridge telling you that it's empty and ordering more things. It's just the, all these things that people dreamt about are happening now. Very cool. Um, we have another question here on YouTube. Um, someone asks, what's the value of an MBA in the new internet economy? And you went to, you, you got your master's in business, business administration. So what do you think the relevance of that is today? Well, the, the winning combination for me is an engineer who becomes an MBA, okay? Um, I be, well, first of all, I should say I believe in MBAs and I believe in, I believe in teaching and I believe in universities. Uh, I'm saying because of Peter Thiel and a lot of people who don't believe in universities but also teach. Um, I, 
but an MBA is a very questionable degree. I have one, by the way, but it's a very questionable degree if it doesn't come with the knowledge of something else, because you can't be an expert in business without an understanding of anything, right? And just know marketing and finance and accounting. So I recommend to anyone who wants to do an MBA to do first some other type of degree. Engineering, of course, I think is the, the most complementary to an MBA and all types of engineering, not just computer science and computer engineering. But I can think of other degrees. For example, I had students who were biologists who then did an MBA and then built biotech companies. Um, so any solid knowledge foundation with an MBA, I think makes a lot of sense. We have tons of questions on YouTube. It's getting crazy out there. Just because, uh, just to remind everyone watching, we will give a free the Web London Pass, uh, courtesy of, um, of Silicon Valley Bank and Link Partners, to people asking questions on YouTube. So we'll pick one question from there. You have more questions, uh, David, for Martin? Do I get to ask a question? Yeah, ask a question from someone. <laughs> not, not from you, just oh. from someone. <laughs> Um, so another question here from Kinder111. Uh, why did you decide not to bring uh, Fon to Argentina? Well, I grew up in Argentina, but Argentina is a country that right now makes it extremely difficult for innovation. The only way that Argentines can innovate is because, of course, they have access to the Internet, and my foundation, Educar, has contributed to that. But it, because of restrictions on imports, it is very difficult to bring Wi-Fi routers to Argentina. Um, we also had a situation where we tried to import Wi-Fi routers and we were asked for bribes. And of course, phone doesn't pay bribes, so we, we took them all back to Spain. Um, so there's corruption and there's importation duties that are incredibly high. Um, and I think the government makes a mistake at that level because there's a, because the internet is culture. To me, to ban internet products is, would be the same as banning books. Uh, so it's unfortunate, and I hope that changes, and I hope we can go to Argentina. But the best way to go to Argentina will probably be in combination with a telecom partner who puts our firmware in their routers, like British Telecom does now, for example, or Belgacom or many other companies. So I hope to go to Argentina, but we cannot go with the model of sending Foneras, the phone, era, the phone Wi-Fi routers. We have to go through a model of reflashing the routers of the operators somewhere a pure software play, and then it's easy to enter. Martin, there is one in Spanish here. Uh, it, it's, uh, and I, I get Spanish just a little bit, but I think it's very interesting. What do you think of, it's from Baptiste blog, it's in Spanish. Capiences del grupo Rocket Internet, so it's with some your brothers, right? Uh, yeah. uh, who are very notorious about copying uh, startups, namely Silicon Valley successes, and not being shy about it, just like fucking copy them mm -hmm. if they generate profit and revenue. What, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I think the activity, uh, I have mixed feelings. I'm friends, I should say, I'm friends uh, with Mark and Oliver, and I, I see them socially, and especially Mark, and I, so I'm talking as a friend. Okay, I would but let's maybe, friend. maybe not everybody knows, so the Samuel Brothers uh, created copycats of, I think, Facebook at the time, right? Of no, uh, right. Groupon, and then they sold it to Groupon, of uh, Amazon in some countries with the exact same logo and design. Right, so they they created a well, lot. They yeah, the biggest success recently was Groupon, but they they started with a clone of Groupon and then they sold to Groupon and then they actually became very active in Groupon, and they became very successful financially out of that. I mean, I don't know if they sold the shares or not. They've come down a lot, but still very successful. Um, so what I was going to say is, to me, there's a fine line copying code. I don't accept, and that's where I think they cross the line, when they copy code. And that's something I have told them, and I, I don't think it's, it's really, you can't do uh, fab.com, the, the version of fab.com in Europe, and just copy their code. 
okay? One thing is to copy an idea. The other thing is to, to copy the code. So I wish that stopped. And in terms of the idea, they are very good at executing. They're very good at executing. So they many times end up working in cooperation. I should also say that American companies are sometimes pretty ignorant of how to act in the rest of the world. So the Samwars can give a great help to them. Um, many American companies are too American. Not all of them, by the way. And some are incredibly good at making the world more American, let's say. Um, so and when you look at the profits of Google, you see that the majority of the profits of Google come from the rest of the world and not the United States. And most of most um, big American companies are incredibly successful outside. So the Samwars want to put themselves at a place where when they start and they're still not aware of the world, they, they copy them, let's say Airbnb, and then they sell to Airbnb, or they copy Uber, they sell to Uber, or like that's, they want to position themselves in that place and let's say it's not what I do. I just wouldn't feel happy doing that. I wouldn't be like the football player who wants to win the cup. David, you want to get to the next one? Yep, so another good question here. Uh, there's a lot of good ones, so it's hard to choose now. Um, the, the, this question is, what is the best country in Europe for internet entrepreneurs in terms of human capital, raising capital, just access to general resources? <laughs> you, you know, that's a great, great question, especially since Martini is moving to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not moving to the U.S. Uh, permanently, I should say, <laughs> but I'm moving to New York at least from September to May. Um, no, I, I will keep hiring in Spain. We hire around four engineers a month in Spain. We have offices in New York, in London, Tokyo, Paris, but we tend to hire more in Spain because right now what the crisis in Spain is creating, while horrible for the country, is very uh, positive for entrepreneurship because when Spain was doing well, it was very getting it was very hard to get people to join startups, and now people realize that the big companies are mostly firing, and that it it is a great time to join a startup. If you look at Google, when Google started, it was kind of like Spain in the sense that Silicon Valley in 2002 was like Spain now. Okay, it was like a total crisis, everybody getting laid off. There were websites that showed you how many people were getting laid off every day. It was, a, it was a tragedy what was happening in Silicon Valley in 2002. Well, 10 years later, we have a kind of similar environment, but for a whole country, Spain. And it is, it is, it is a great, just like Google got started and got all the engineers at a time when everyone else was firing. So when you look at a lot of the success of Google, was that they could hire at that moment. Okay, so they could get the best people at that moment. And I think Spain has a tremendous situation now for doing that. But the, the part that is really bad about Spain is the financing. So if you can get your financing elsewhere, then you can go to Spain. England or the UK is actually very good for the financing, probably the best place in Europe for financing, has a good uh, I mean, London is doing amazing things for innovation, so I would say the Spanish answer comes with a big caveat. I think London is the natural place, and the other one is Berlin. Berlin is becoming a big, big center for tech development in Europe. It's a wonderful city, amazing people, extremely committed and smart employees uh, or partners. Um, so uh, those are the ones I would mention. And then, of course, Israel, <laughs> Israel, you, which is known. Sorry, interesting you have not uh, mentioned France at all. Or do you think the change of government there is? Uh, I, think, I think you have to be French to understand how to do business in France. It is, I think France has the least business friendly. It, it is so difficult to do business. I mean, I, I think... Some French people are incredible, like if you look at companies like Carrefour, right? And we say, well, 
how does Carrefour, how is Carrefour one of the largest, if not the largest, supermarket chain in the world, or I don't know, compared to Walmart, but probably up there. How do they do it? And I think, well, if you learn how to manage French employees, you can make it anywhere, you know? Let's get another question because it's getting crazy over there. David, you think All right, yeah, one? another question. What do you think of startup accelerators? Um, I think that they are good and I don't know how to put it. I believe in a community of startups. I believe that startups like to be in communities. And I believe that being in a community is a great thing. Being in a community of like-minded people doing startups, but maybe different startups. So I totally believe in the concept of general assembly or communities where people work together. Where it gets more complicated is where people work together, they all have equity, the equity is all owned by the same people, because then you don't have a random process. Then it's kind of like a like a, the genetic pool of startups becomes dominated by a few decision makers who are the investors in this pool who decide what the pool is going to look like and then there's less diversity and there's um, so I'm in favor of random pools of startups that get together in one place I'm less in favor of a genetic view of of uh, accelerators but there's some that I have undoubtedly done incredibly well. Right now. What uh, do you think? Wait, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Martin, did you get <laughs> me? Or <laughs> yes, first. I I didn't hear anything until can you guys hear me? <laughs> Louis, you didn't come through. Do you want to? Ask, you can go ahead. Okay, go. Uh, sorry, um, there are a number of questions around the Facebook IPO crash, and uh, whether we're in a bubble or not. What do you think? Well, I think the crash shows that we're not in a bubble. Um, a bubble would have been Facebook trading at seventy. Um, I think the market was extremely rational with Facebook, and I think the Facebook guys made a huge mistake in going public at 38. I think if they had gone public at 32 or 28, the stock would have gone up, and, and they really did a lot of damage to everyone else in the market in order to get a few more, a few more dollars because there were a lot of insiders selling, and it was a 16 billion IPO of which 8 billion, I think, was going to the company, and 8 billion was just people cashing out and hoping to get the most money they could possibly get as they kiss their shares, their Facebook shares goodbye. Right. Wow, are you sure about that? It's a half 8 billion went actually to their pockets. Really? Wow. Well, uh, I would like to search this, and I, maybe I'm making a mistake, but I'm, I have a, I, I mean, I could look it up right now, or maybe somebody else can, but I'm almost sure that a very large portion, could be as much as $8 billion, did not go into the company. Now I see two Davies, one Loic, and I can't hear anybody. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> the hangout go, just go. freaked out. I don't even know what just happened, go, but we're go. still here. Go ahead. Go ahead, Martin. But did you hear my my answer about the eight billion or I, I did, yes. Okay. So I'm done with my answer. <laughs> okay, so we're not in a bubble. No, we're not in a bubble. In fact, uh, we're in a market that's extremely cautious about a lot of things. I, I worry about almost the opposite of a bubble. I think that uh, maybe people in Silicon Valley are, are have this exuberant feeling that everything is going incredibly well, but 
I think you don't have to go too far from Silicon Valley to realize that there's a lot of people out there who are not doing well at all. All right, we're going to take a couple more questions here and then wrap it up soon with one question of our own. Um, this one's from Sam. Uh, has New York City become the new promised land for startups, considering you're going to go spend some time there? Well, I, I, uh, I think New York City uh, has done a lot for technology in the last five years. It's been amazing. I think Bloomberg is not a media person. He's a technology person, and he built everybody else who had a media empire went to hell, and Bloomberg thrived as mayor and thrived as a businessman in competition with the internet, selling terminals like his own private internet. I mean, I think Bloomberg is pretty much a genius out there in a lot of technology issues, and he's managed to convince, probably personally, probably personally, I can imagine that Michael Bloomberg went on a roadshow to convince a lot of companies to go to New York. And uh, and I think he's great. He's great, and I wish New York would keep him for, for a long time. Um, now, New York has something that Silicon Valley doesn't have, which is an afterlife, right? I mean, when you're in Silicon Valley and you leave work, what do you do? You know, it's like, it, it's depressing, you know. And, and, and New York offers developers, engineers, a life, you know, a life beyond work, you know, a, an exciting city with tons of things to do, clubs, parties. I don't, I don't know, it's just so different. Silicon Valley is more like for families, and, but a lot of these developers are 19, okay, or 25. They're not, they're not thinking of the best place to raise a family. So New York also has this advantage of a life that is so fascinating to people. Um, and so I think Silicon Valley will always be Silicon Valley, by the way, and will always be ahead of New York in, in the foreseeable future. And I don't, I'm not talking about anything radical here. But I can see how Facebook, Google, or Tumblr, or Foursquare, or many others, or phone, when we had to choose an office, we chose to have it in New York. The proximity to Europe, of course, is important for us. But also in our case of phone, our customers, which are the telcos, are all East Coast. They're not West Coast. So there's also the advertising, the finance. There's so many things in the ecosystem of New York that I think New York is going to be uh, the second largest tech area of the United States and maybe soon of the world. Martin, there are a few questions uh, in there about uh, starting a company. So it's like two in one. Two. What's your advice for uh, first-time entrepreneurs? And um, adding to that, which, what space, what would you start if you are not busy with uh, all the biking and sailing and uh, running fun from your bike? <laughs> well, I... I um I think in terms of starting your first company, generally the people who are starting their first companies have two choices. Uh, start a company or get a job, right? And getting a job is, is many times comforting and safe uh, compared to starting a company because companies are like, um, well, most of them fail, right? I, I, but really most of them, most, most of them fail. It is so common. And so, um, but when I was, when my father died and I had to start, I wanted to start a company, but my mother wanted me to get a job. And, um, and I felt this pressure by my family to go and get a job, you know. And, but I would go to the job interviews and they would say, well, how do you see yourself in five years? And I would say, well, at least as your boss. And is this feeling that you can't stand the idea of having a boss. You can't stand the idea of not being the master of your own destiny. You can't stand the idea of some asshole telling you what to do. You know, so it is, I would say, you have to start a company if you just can't go to sleep at night if you're not running your own destiny. Otherwise, get a job and enjoy it because you're most likely, it's safer. 
and likely to more likely to do better, although not exceptional. Uh, and uh, what are the spaces you're looking at? What, what, would, what, what would you what would you start if you were not doing what you're doing? Well, the easiest the easiest space now the easiest is a designer and an engineer, who, a programmer and a designer who get together to do an app. That is the, the, the space that requires the least capital. It's the Instagram story. And of course, for one Instagram, there's so many others that didn't make it. But what I'm saying is if you don't have capital, but you're an engineer or a designer, you can start a company with almost no money. Everything else takes more capital. Okay, um, David, yeah. you have one. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here because you're very busy. Thank you so much for your time so far. Um, what is the best advice? No, he's not. He's received? not busy. He, he, he's, <laughs> not he's not busy. busy. He he's got to go no, biking. He, explained, again. <laughs> he um, did explain you nope. earlier that he was not busy. <laughs> I'm going. To, I have an I have an appointment with Netflix to watch uh, either Mad Men or Downtown Abbey. So please uh, let's finish. This. Okay, well, okay, now this interview is going to be three hours, so... <laughs> um, I lost you. Can you hear me now? Now, yes. Okay. Okay, take three. <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever received as an entrepreneur that you can now pass along to other entrepreneurs? Hmm. Well... This is going to sound strange, okay? Because a lot of people, and it refers back to getting an education. Like I, I had entrepreneurial, I had a desire for entrepreneurship since I was very, very young, like maybe 15, 16. And, but I hated the idea of getting a business education. So I studied philosophy in my undergrad and I studied I, I really didn't think a business education made sense. And then this uncle of mine, because my father had died, this uncle of mine, he, he said, I can see, I can see that you have it in you to be an entrepreneur. But you can't, you are not going to be able to articulate what you want to do if you don't get some kind of business education. If you don't know how to write a business plan, if you don't know how to talk to people in their language, if you don't know, you know, and, and this advice was, I got when I was very young and I was so reluctant to study business and I, I felt that it was a career for morons. And I also actually hated business. I thought I was an entrepreneur just to pay money to, to pay my studies of philosophy and biology and other things that I studied. I, I felt be, there was something negative about business. I was also from a left-wing background. Um, but actually to get some kind of business education, whether on your own, because the guys who have the money, they speak a certain language. And if you don't speak it, it's going to be hard to understand each other. David, I think we should release Martin. Uh, by the way, Nina showed up in the YouTube comments, which I think is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I sent her a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, yeah. well, we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks so much, Martin, for your time. It was really good. Uh, June 19th and 20th, coming up really quick. Uh, we're going to be giving away more tickets on our Google Plus page, on Facebook, on Twitter. So stay tuned. Keep listening. We'll be doing more interviews with amazing people like Martin and other speakers. Um, Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next time. And we're no, going to you. announce which question we uh, won the pass on the YouTube comments in a, in a Ah, minute. yes. To yes, just we're... release Martin. Martin, thanks so much for being yes. with us. <laughs> okay, take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. This was great. Okay, guys. Thanks. See you in the comments. <laughs>